Did you know that each year, over 125,000 Americans die from overdose and suicide combined? That doesn't even count the other causes of death related to substance misuse and mental health. These people are our friends, our neighbors, our family members, our favorite celebrities, our community members. Some of them are parents with children who depend on them to keep them safe, and their deaths are totally preventable. As you know if you've listened to my podcast, the topics of drug use and mental illness frequently come up in the stories I cover, and it's really important that we address these issues to prevent unnecessary deaths. Jay Schiffman is a public speaker, coach, and host of the Choose Your Struggle podcast, where he interviews people with real-life experience about mental health, substance misuse and recovery, and drug use and policy to help end stigma and normalize these difficult conversations through empathy and vulnerability. There are plenty of system changes that need to happen in this country, from child protective services to family court, all the way to mental health and drug treatment. Until we can have honest conversations about these topics, lives will continue to be lost. That's why Jay produces the Choose Your Struggle podcast and tells his own personal story. As someone in long-term recovery himself who survived two suicide attempts and an overdose, Jay recognizes that he's been given a second chance in a country and a world where a lot of people don't even get their first, and he uses it to make a difference. Jay works every day to help end the stigma and ensure those who need help get the help they deserve, because we're in this together. Find the Choose Your Struggle podcast on your favorite listening platform. This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 52, Damien Sutton, part one. On August 21st, 2013, 26-year-old Ronald DeMombro Jr. called 911 to summon an ambulance to his family's lavish home in Washington Township, Michigan. Ron said a little boy in his care, two-year-old Damien Sutton, was having an asthma attack. But later that evening, after giving a detective multiple versions of his story, Ron confessed to shaking the toddler and was charged with felony child abuse. When Damien died six days later, Ron's charge was upgraded to murder. In this episode, you'll hear the story of a little boy with enormous blue eyes, whose light was snuffed out by a man pretending to be his mother's boyfriend and you'll hear how that man's barbaric actions dragged Damien's family through not one, but two murder trials. Next week, you'll hear my interview with Damien's maternal grandmother, Tara Thompson, who Damien called Nana. This is part one of the gut-wrenching story of Damien Sutton. My sources for this week were Click on Detroit, CBS Detroit, The Macomb Daily, The Daily Mail, The Huffington Post, The Morning Sun, MLive.com, The Detroit Free Press, Legacy.com, Find a Grave, Oakland County Legal News, Court Documents, and Tara Thompson. I'd like to take a moment to thank my newest patrons, Sherry from Sarasota, Florida, Kaylee from Nampa, Idaho, and Samantha from Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. Thank you so much to all my patrons. Your pledges bring me closer to my goal of devoting myself full-time to the podcast and the blog, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate your support. I'm a little behind on sending out your rewards, but they're going out this week. Anyone else who'd like to become a patron can visit www.sufferthelittlechildrenpod.com and click Become a Patron in the upper right corner. If you'd like to make a one-time donation, you can do that by visiting www.sufferthelittlechildrenblog.com slash support. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to all my listeners, whether you've been listening from the beginning or this is the first episode you're hearing. Now let's dive into Damien's story. Damien Rylan Sutton was born on June 4, 2011, the first child of both 20-year-old Nicole Marie Sutton and 21-year-old Timothy Russell Sutton, who had married the year before. Both Nikki and Tim doted on Damien, 
who was a strong, independent, good-natured baby with big, striking blue eyes and, eventually, a head full of fine blonde hair. The trio lived in Macomb County, Michigan, with Nikki's mom, Tara Thompson, who helped raise Damien for the first year and a half of his life. By 2013, Tim and Nikki had separated. When Nikki and Tara later had a falling out, Nikki and Damien moved in with Nikki's father, Mike McLaughlin, but when that was no longer feasible, Nikki was forced to find a place for herself and Damien to live. The same year, Tara had begun working for 26-year-old Ronald DeMombro Jr., who had a small business delivering cell phones. Tara's boss, Ron, who had met Nikki and was willing to help her out, offered her and Damien a place to stay, with him and his parents, Ronald Sr. and Kitty DeMombro, in their large, lavish home at 8588 Grand Oaks Court in Washington Township, Michigan, about 30 miles north of Detroit. The house, which was built in 1998, was a four-bedroom, two-bathroom home that has been described as anywhere from 3,200 to 6,000 square feet. The DeMombro's property spanned one and a half acres of land. The only stipulation, Ron told Nikki, was that she would have to pretend to be his girlfriend because his parents would never allow him to house some random girl and her baby. With no other options, Nikki agreed, and she and Damien moved into the third floor of the DeMombro house with Ron. On top of a new home, Nikki also had a new job working at Younger's Irish Tavern in the nearby village of Romeo, and with all her family relationships strained, she had no choice but to ask Ron, Kit, and Ron Sr. to babysit at times while she worked her late afternoon and evening shifts at the tavern. She had no reason to believe Damien was in anything other than the best of hands when she did so. After all, Ron was good enough to allow, as he said, some random girl and her baby to move in with him and his parents were upstanding citizens living in a huge, beautiful home. Nikki had no idea that the man she would entrust her son's care, well-being, and very life with had a history of violent domestic outbursts. Ron certainly didn't mention this, nor did Ron Sr., Kit, or any of Ron's various siblings. When, a week or so after they moved in, Damien took a tumble down a short set of carpeted stairs and ended up with a few scuff marks on his face, Nikki admonished Ron, who swore he would be more careful in the future. She had no reason to believe the incident was anything but an accident. With the benefit of hindsight, of course, we're all screaming to be heard above the flapping of dozens of red flags, but at the time, Nikki, a 22-year-old single mother, was unaware of the dangers of leaving her two-year-old son in the care of a man without biological or emotional ties. For all she knew, Ronald Anthony DeMombro Jr., a dark-haired man with narrow brown eyes and a low brow, who stood about five foot nine and weighed around 200 pounds, was a decent, trustworthy guy. Tragically, by the time she found out otherwise, it would be too late. At 4.53 p.m. on Wednesday, August 21, 2013, Jason Foltz called his brother Ronald DeMombro Jr., later noting that Ron sounded frantic during the call. At 5.12 p.m., immediately after hanging up with Jason, Ron called 911. 911, what's the case of emergency? Uh, yes, um, my... My uh, girlfriend's uh, child is not breathing. Not breathing? Yeah, he, he's not breathing, right? Breathing, but uh, he's breathing. He's like hiccuping. I'm not sure. He might have asthma or something. Okay, so he he has some kind of air. He has How old is he? He's two. Or he might have some in the throat. My dad says. Your my address is 8588 Grand Oaks Court, Washington, Michigan 48095. I don't, I need, we need help immediately. I got help coming. During the call, Ron also told the dispatcher, He's not moving. He's not responsive to any verbal, he's gasping. After hanging up with the dispatcher, Ron next called Younger's Irish Tavern and told Nikki he had called 911 for Damien, who was having an asthma attack. Immediately, Nikki knew something was wrong. Her son did not have asthma. Damien was rushed by ambulance to Henry Ford Macomb Hospital in Clinton Township in critical condition. Meanwhile, Ron Sr. and Ron picked Nikki up from work and drove her to the hospital. Medical staff at Henry Ford assessed Damien and determined he had head injuries severe enough to warrant his immediate transfer to Children's Hospital in Detroit. Doctors at Children's Hospital contacted authorities and told them Damien had suffered severe head trauma consistent with shaken baby syndrome and that it was one of the most severe cases of shaken baby syndrome they had ever seen. Later that same evening, Ron sat down with Detective Eric Erler at the Macomb County Sheriff's Office to talk about what had happened to Damien. At first, Ron told the detective that while watching Damien for Nikki, who was at work, 
he had put Damien in his pack-and-play to answer a phone call. At the time, he said, Damien seemed fine, but when he returned and picked Damien up out of the playpen, the little boy went limp. Ron said at that time he summoned his father from outside, where Ron Sr. was doing yard work, and then called 911. While coming up with possible explanations for Damien's head injuries, Ron told the detective that on another recent occasion while babysitting, he had hit Damien in the head with a basketball. He also recounted an incident he described as being like a football fumble, in which Damien fell from his arms and hit his head. Finally, Ron told Detective Erler that Damien was crying, so to quiet him, he shook the toddler for up to 30 seconds. He later changed this time frame to 5 to 10 seconds, saying he thought shaking Damien would make him laugh, which Ron claimed it had in the past. Based on Ron's various stories and excuses, he was arrested on the spot and held in the Macomb County Jail. On Friday, August 23, 2013, Ronald Anthony DeMombro Jr. was arraigned in 42nd District Court in Romeo, Michigan, on a charge of first-degree child abuse, which held a sentence of up to life in prison. At the hearing, Ron entered a plea of not guilty and was ordered held on a cash or surety bond of $500,000. He was also assigned a public defender, attorney Randy Rodnick. All this time, Damien clung to life at Children's Hospital, with swelling and bleeding in his brain. He had been placed into a medically induced coma and was breathing with the aid of a respirator. A candlelight vigil was held across the street from the hospital, where people offered prayers for Damien. Local news stations had also taken notice of Damien's story. Through tears, Nikki told CBS Detroit that in her opinion, Ron deliberately injured Damien because he was jealous of her son, and she hoped he went to prison for life because Damien deserves justice. He is such a beautiful boy who had a lot stolen from him, and it wasn't his fault. She said she held out hope for Damien's recovery. Miracles happen. I want to see Damien smile again. Nikki told another reporter about how Damien always wanted her to kiss his every little boo-boo. Even if it was a scab that's already healed, he would need it to be kissed constantly. So I kiss his head for him, and I, I say, all better, trying to get his pressures to go down. Damien's father, Tim Sutton, told CBS Detroit that he didn't understand why his ex-wife's boyfriend would do this to a child. Was he mad, or was it just because he wanted to? How did a 27-year-old man get so agitated by a two-year-old boy to do this to him? Tim talked about how Damien was in a medically induced coma due to bleeding and massive swelling in his brain. Like the doctor told me, it's going to be a really touchy situation. Nobody's sure what's going to happen. As the doctor told me, if he survives, he is going to have severe brain damage, and he's not going to be the same hyper-energetic Damien that I know. With how strong he is, he'll pull through, and he'll be able to overcome it. I'm sure of it. Bad news, as the doctor told me, she's more than certain that he's obviously not going to be the same Damien. Tim told WXYZ, Originally, what we thought is he fell out of a playpen. The story changed to he had an asthma attack, and this was coming from the babysitter boyfriend at the time. He admitted to physically harming him by shaking him roughly and then throwing him. By this time, the family had set up a GoFundMe to help with medical costs and donations for the family were also being accepted under the Damien Sutton Fund at any Fifth Third Bank location. The community rallied around Damien's family during this dark, uncertain time. On Saturday, August 24th, a fundraiser was held for Damien at the Alibi Bar in Warren, where attendees were asked to wear white to represent being one of Damien's angels. On Sunday, August 25th, Damien underwent emergency surgery to remove part of his skull, which doctors hoped would reduce the pressure on his swelling brain. On Monday, August 26th, doctors began weaning Damien off his various medications, including those that were no longer working, to control his blood pressure and the pressure in his brain, as well as the medications sedating him. The family was devastated to find out Damien only had about 20% brain activity and that it would take a miracle for their little boy to survive. Damien's great aunt, Cora Leibowitz, told a reporter, The doctor said in 12 years that he's been doing this, he's never had a patient survive. So the likelihood of Damien surviving is very low. And um, if he does, he will be in a hospital bed for the rest of his life on a breathing machine. So whether or not his parents choose to do that, we don't know yet. On the morning of Tuesday, August 27, 2013, Nikki and Tim made the impossible decision to remove Damien from life support. Nikki held Damien in her arms as Tim sat nearby softly reassuring his son that everything would be okay, and at 7.41 a.m., Damien Ryland Sutton 
took his last breath in his mommy's arms. The day Damien died, Ron was due in court for a preliminary examination on his child abuse charge, but it was expected that the prosecutor would bring additional charges in light of Damien's death. Eric Smith, Macomb County prosecuting attorney at the time, had first stepped into the public eye in 2007 when he prosecuted Stephen Grant for strangling and dismembering his wife, Tara Grant, in February of the same year. Coincidentally, just before I began researching Damien's story, I was listening to the recent episode about Tara Grant on the True Crime Reverie podcast, where Paige handled the case in her usual sensitive, thorough manner. I recommend giving that episode a listen if you're so inclined. Stephen Grant was convicted of Tara's murder in December of 2007 and subsequently received a sentence of 50 to 80 years in prison. Tara Grant's case was the last one Eric Smith had personally handled until Damien's came along. Damien's case was personal to him, Smith told reporters, as the father of small children himself. In this case, when you're dealing with the murder of a two-year-old, I want to make sure my fingerprints are all over it. Earlier that day, the judge had already revoked Ron's $500,000 bond. During the court hearing, Eric Smith told the judge the autopsy would be conducted the following day and additional charges would hinge on the medical examiner's determination. Smith said, If it comes back that the child abuse was the cause of his death, we will up it to felony murder immediately. In a statement, Prosecutor Smith said, Violence against Macomb County children will not be tolerated. The full weight and resources of this office will be used to seek justice for Damian Sutton. That evening, Nikki's manager and co-workers at Younger's Irish Tavern in downtown Romeo held a fundraiser during which food and beverages were donated by the tavern, and any funds collected would be donated to Damien's family to help with medical and funeral expenses. Although Nikki had only worked at the tavern for a few weeks at that point, she was well-liked, and both her co-workers and the community felt compelled to help. Owner Glenn Wilhelm said, My phone has been ringing non-stop for people around in this community, and it's the same thing said every time I pick up the phone. It's, Glenn, what can we do? More than 800 people showed up during the duration of the fundraiser, which brought in over $16,000 for Nikki and her family. On Wednesday, August 28, 2013, Macomb County Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Daniel Spitz conducted Damien's autopsy, during which he ruled Damien's death was a homicide caused by blunt force trauma inflicted via two severe blows to the head. Immediately, Prosecutor Eric Smith charged Ronald DeMombro Jr. with first-degree felony murder, for which Ron was scheduled to be arraigned on September 10th. Smith also publicly defended Nikki in light of some community members' insistence on blaming her for her son's death because she left Damien with the man everyone continued to think was her boyfriend. As some of you probably know, I consider this victim-blaming as well, and it drives me out of my mind. Smith said, You know, She's living in a 5,000-square-foot mansion in northern Macomb with her boyfriend and his parents, and she's thinking that she's providing a future for Damien. She was very clear that this defendant has never shown a violent side toward her. This is the last thing she ever thought would happen. People need to realize that this woman did everything she could to provide the best possible life for her child. From everything we've seen, the blame lies on one person, the defendant. Damien's funeral was held on Friday, August 30th. The funeral itself was private, but a public viewing was held from 3 to 8 p.m. at Lynch & Sons Funeral Home in Clawson, which donated its services to the family. Other vendors donated Damien's casket, the vault, and the burial plot. Since the funeral was paid for by the generosity of others, the family said they would use the money collected in Damien's name to prevent similar tragedies in the future by donating the funds to child abuse foundations. Damien, the friendly, playful, independent boy with the bottomless blue eyes who loved superheroes and rock and roll music, was buried in the Resurrection Cemetery in Clinton Township wearing his Batman t-shirt. Surprisingly, after Ron DeMombro's mental competency was established, there were few delays in bringing the case to trial. On charges of first-degree child abuse and first-degree felony murder, the latter of which held an automatic sentence of life in prison, Ronald Anthony DeMombro Jr. would be tried before a jury of his peers in Macomb County Circuit Court, overseen by the Honorable Judge Jennifer Fonts, in June of 2014. During his opening statement on Thursday, June 5, 2014, Prosecutor Eric Smith deflected the defense's plan to lay the blame for Damien's death on his mother, saying, This case is not about Nikki. It's not about her decision in trying to better her life. This is abuse that occurred at the hands of the defendant. 
In his statement, Prosecutor Smith went over the bullet points of the case, saying that within hours of Damien's injury, Ron told Macomb County Sheriff's Detective Eric Erlers multiple versions of what happened to the two-year-old boy, including speculating that Damien's injuries may have occurred days before. Smith said Ron's explanations got progressively more violent, from asthma to playpen accident to hit with a ball to fumbling him like a football to shaking. By his own admission, Ron told the detective he grew frustrated with Damien while caring for him on August 21st, 2013, because the toddler was whining and fussing and crying uncontrollably. Smith said Ron then tried to mitigate his own statements by claiming Damien was fine, okay, or perfect 22 times in the same interview. Smith also mentioned Ron's comment about shaking Damien for 30 seconds to stop him from crying which, he said, Ron later amended to less than 10 seconds or not long at all. Smith said the symptoms started immediately after Damien's injury. The medical experts will tell you these injuries would have been noticeable by anyone, not just EMS, not by doctors, but immediately noticeable by all of us. He would not appear normal in any way. His breathing would be compromised. He would not be playing, interacting. Smith told the jury he believed Ron inflicted the injuries moments before his brother, Jason, called him at 4.53 p.m. and said Ron sounded frantic. That call ended at 5.12 p.m. when EMS was called. Multiple witnesses would testify for the prosecution, including Nikki Sutton, Lieutenant Michael McKenzie, responding paramedic, Dr. Mary Lou Angelilli, pediatrician at Children's Hospital, who was certified as an expert in the field of child abuse, Deputy Brett Sibniewski, evidence technician, Jason Foltz, Ron's half-brother, Jason's 10-year-old daughter, Detective Eric Erler, lead investigator, and Dr. Daniel Spitz, chief medical examiner for Macomb County. Defense attorney Randy Rodnick told jurors during his opening statement that his client did not purposely or intentionally cause Damien's injuries. He asked them to consider that Damien's injuries could have been caused by prior incidents, such as an incident that occurred about two days before Damien was hospitalized, when the toddler fell backward while sitting on a bar stool on top of two phone books at the Kitchen Island. Rodnick told the jurors they would hear multiple theories about what happened and reminded them that the prosecution, not the defense, bore the burden of proving its case. The defense witness list was markedly shorter and included Ron's mother, Kit DeMombro, two acquaintances of Ron's who had no knowledge of the case, and Washtenaw County Medical Examiner Dr. Bader Casson, who would testify as an expert witness for the defense. After opening statements concluded, the state's first witness was Nikki Sutton, who was by that time heavily pregnant with her second child. Throughout her testimony, Nikki refused to look at Ron, who she referred to solely as the defendant. Under questioning, Nikki said that shortly after she and Damien's father, Tim Sutton, broke up, Ron talked her into moving in with him and his parents, where he, Nikki, and Damien would reside on the third floor of the DeMombro's enormous three-story home. Nikki testified that Ron wasn't used to watching younger kids, and that Damien seemed to have more accidents when Ron babysat. One example took place about two weeks before Damien was hospitalized, when the baby fell down a flight of four or five carpeted basement stairs and got marks on his face. Nikki testified, I started yelling at the defendant. I freaked out. He said, I swear I'll be more careful. About a week before Damien's hospitalization, Nikki said on the stand, Ron made a sick joke when she arrived home from work, saying, I had a breakdown. Your baby is dead. I said, why would you say that? He said it was a sick joke. In her account of the barstool incident, Nikki said she was in the living room with Ron when she heard the thud of the chair hitting the floor and ran to the kitchen. Although Damien cried out of fright from the fall, she swore Damien did not hit his head, although Rodnick insisted he had. His head was nowhere near the floor, Nikki testified, adding that when she searched for injuries on Damien's head, I didn't find anything. On August 21, 2013, Nikki said, Damien watched her put on her makeup while she got ready for her 4 p.m. shift at the tavern. When she left, he was sitting at the table. Crying, Nikki testified, I gave Damien a kiss goodbye, and he said, I love you, Mommy. That's the last time I saw my baby boy. I gave him a kiss and a hug and stuff goodbye. Ron Sr. drove her to work, she said, and just after 5 p.m., she got a call at the tavern from Ron, who said he had called 911 because Damien had suffered an asthma attack. I told him, my son doesn't have asthma. I knew right there something was wrong. With all the video conferencing and virtual meetings going on these days, we all want to look our best. If you're like me, you're probably confused by all the different methods of teeth whitening on the market. 
Now that I'm partnering with Smile Brilliant, I've learned a few things that you might find helpful about home teeth whitening methods. For example, LED lights are a novelty item. Whitening strips neglect the gum lines, crevices, and molars. Charcoal is abrasive and wears down your enamel. And whitening toothpaste only works on surface stains. So if none of these miracle products really works, what does? The number one product recommended by dentists is the custom-fitted tray, which usually costs an arm and a leg because they require a dentist to make them by hand using a model of your teeth. With Smile Brilliant's Lab Direct process, you can get custom-fitted teeth whitening trays at a fraction of the price without a single visit to the dentist. Using an exact model of your teeth, Smile Brilliant's lab technicians will handcraft your trays to give you the best possible whitening results. All you have to do is visit smilebrilliant.com, and when you order their system, make sure you use the coupon code CHILDREN at checkout for 30% off. When you receive the package from Smile Brilliant, it's really simple. You just make your dental impressions at home and return them using the prepaid envelope they provide you. In a matter of one week, Smile Brilliant will have your trays back in the mail. Using my coupon code, CHILDREN, means you're supporting me while saving a huge amount of money. So check out smilebrilliant.com today. When the state called Ron's 10-year-old niece, who I'll call M.F., to the stand, she testified that Ronnie was really mean to Damien when Nikki wasn't there. Under questioning, she stated that Ron told her he hated Damien and wished he would die. He pushes his head really hard. He shakes Damien. He tosses him on Ronnie's bed. I saw Ronnie slapping Damien all over. Another state witness, Children's Hospital pediatrician Dr. Mary Lou Angelilli, testified that she was certain Damien's injuries were caused by non-accidental inflicted trauma, specifically child abuse. She did not rely on Dr. Spitz's autopsy report for her diagnosis, nor did she view Damien's brain. Based on her expertise, Dr. Angelilli said Damien's injuries, which she compared to those suffered in a fall from a two-story building, could not have been caused by a household fall. On Monday, June 9, 2014, the defense called its first witness, Ronald's mother, Kitty DeMombro. Kit testified that after Damien's fall from the bar stool prior to his hospitalization, he acted differently than usual. This testimony corroborated her earlier statement to a CPS worker that Damien had been lethargic as opposed to his usual friendly and playful personality and healthy appetite. He wasn't communicating. He wasn't playing. He wasn't himself. He wasn't active at all. However, earlier in the trial, medical examiner Dr. Daniel Spitz testified that he was certain Damien would have shown obvious and serious symptoms of his blunt force trauma injury within minutes of its infliction. On cross-examination, Prosecutor Smith questioned Kit about why she waited two months to tell a CPS worker on October 30th about Damien's fall, and why she had not reported her observations to any other authorities. She replied that she had told her son's attorney, as well as Nikki. During testimony, Kit stated that the barstool incident took place the day before Damien was hospitalized, which contradicted both Ron and Nikki's testimony that the fall occurred two to three days prior. Nikki had testified on day one of the trial that Damien showed no symptoms or signs of injury after the fall. The barstool itself was brought into the courtroom, where Prosecutor Smith made a show of measuring the height of the seat, plus the two telephone books on which Damien sat demonstrating for the jury that Damien would have fallen a mere two feet and five inches to the ceramic tile in the kitchen. The same day, after a lengthy debate among the attorneys and the judge, Judge Fonts, saying it was unsupported by the evidence presented, denied Rodnick's request to add involuntary manslaughter as a possible verdict for the jury to reach. As it was, the only possible verdicts were guilty of either first- or second-degree murder and child abuse, or not guilty of either or both. As a last gasp to prove Ron's lack of culpability, Rodnick called expert witness and medical examiner Dr. Bader Kasson to the stand to rebut testimony from the medical examiner Dr. Daniel Spitz. In Dr. Kasson's opinion, Damien's injuries could have been suffered intentionally or accidentally. He said, There's no indication of intent for the injuries sustained. Without information on intent, we can't distinguish between accident and intentional injury. I think manner of death is an issue. I'm not sure it's homicide. It's certainly a possibility. Even though he said Damien's fall from the bar stool, plus a couple other incidents that happened a week or so before, could have contributed to Damien's death, Casson also agreed with Assistant Prosecutor Therese Tobin that Damien's injuries were caused by more than gravitational force. Both sides presented closing arguments on Tuesday, June 10, 2014, after which the jury was sent to deliberate. 
Shockingly, less than an hour later, they returned with a verdict. 27-year-old Ronald Anthony DeMombro Jr. was found guilty of first-degree felony murder and first-degree child abuse. As the verdict was read, Ron, with his head down, showed no emotion. Behind him, his mother, Kit, was in tears, sitting next to his father, Ron Sr. When the jurors exited the courtroom, Ron Sr. and Kit did not stand with the rest of the spectators in the courtroom. Afterward, attorney Randy Rodnick told a reporter about the DeMombros. They're destroyed. He said he and Ronald disagreed on the trial strategy. While Ron only wanted the jury to believe he was completely innocent, Rodnick had sought to pursue involuntary manslaughter, but was shot down by the judge. As for the case he presented, Rodnick said, I thought I made an argument for second degree. The confession didn't help. Both Nikki and Tim spoke with a reporter from the Macomb Daily outside the courtroom. Damien got his justice because Damien's a miracle. He's going to get it. It's my son. This, this was a very quick deliberation. Mm-hmm. Is that heartening for you that it did not take this jury long? It was beautiful. You did such a good job, the prosecution and everything. I just, I just believe that fate worked out the way it was supposed to. And my son, he's going to change the world. And he showed me in so many ways that he's still here. So I don't believe that monster could take him his soul away. And his soul is an old soul. He's a beautiful soul. And I think a lot of people see it through his eyes. And he's not gone, and he will change the world, and I promise that. You you may think he's gone, but he was more than just a two-year-old boy. It was really quick, um, 30, 45 minutes, I believe. So, yeah. Was there ever a doubt in your mind that this would be the verdict? Uh, No, it did make me nervous, though, when they did bring up second-degree child abuse as second As an option, you mean? As an option, yes. That did make me a little bit more nervous. But uh, overall, I mean, I'm very relieved that they did go with the first degree. Um, mm-hmm. It's a lot more calming. Um, not as so much anger. Yeah. Okay. Was it tough sitting through the trial, or how tough was it? Yeah, it was hard, um, especially the pictures, some of the pictures that we had to see but, um, of my son laying down on it. It was harder, yeah. But, uh, You wanted to be here for him. Yeah, definitely. After the verdict was delivered, Prosecutor Eric Smith also spoke to reporters. The evidence in the case was pretty clear, and we presented it in a way that made it, I think, made it easy for the jury to see that the defendant committed these crimes. You know, we are talking about the death of a two-year-old boy, and to come up with the lies and the stories that the defendant came up with to try and cover it is a little offensive. The jury got the case about 4 o'clock. At about 4.45 p.m., we got a message that they had a verdict. They came back with a verdict that we were hoping for, that we had been pushing for, and we asked them to come back with guilty of first-degree felony murder and guilty of first-degree child abuse. When a child dies, everyone is on top of their game, from the sheriff's department, initial interviews, right through to today with the jury's verdict. If it helps the family, we are happy they are able to move on a little from this, and we hope the verdict can help them. I hate to say bring closure, but it certainly has to put a smile on everybody's face. In a news release, Prosecutor Smith said, Justice spoke for Damien today. We hope that this verdict brings some measure of solace to his mother and his relatives. The death of this little boy shocks our community. The loss of this tender young life strikes each of us at the heart. Ron's sentencing took place on Thursday, July 24, 2014. At the hearing, both of Damien's parents were permitted to speak before the court. Tim told the judge that Damien's birth changed his life for the better. There was nothing really good in my life. I was making wrong decisions. Over the next two years, Tim said, he was able to get his act together and obtain a decent job to provide for his son. No matter what happened or what kind of mood I was in, he put a smile on my face. When it was her turn to provide an impact statement, Nikki said, I will never understand how anybody could hurt my innocent baby. But to me, it's not where near the suffering and pain that he deserves. He deserves much more. He deserves the pain a mother feels when someone takes her child's life, her only child's life. There's no suffering greater than the pain I endured with the loss of my son. My baby boy died in my arms in this blanket as I held him close to my chest, my heart against my chest. 
He took his last breath at only two years old on August 27th in my arms. I never thought someone could take Damien's life or that I would have to bury my baby boy, my only son. Ron, too, was allowed to speak prior to sentencing, saying, This was not intentional by any means necessary. I did not intend for him to sustain these injuries. It was, it was, it was simply an accident. When it came time for the sentence to be delivered, Judge Jennifer Fonts told Ron, You've created a pain that will never go away. As expected, Ron received the automatic sentence of life in prison with no possibility of parole, which attorney Rodnick said they would appeal. In most cases, we hear a defense attorney say that and think, blah, 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 good luck with that, sucker. In this case, as it turned out, Ronald DeMombro Jr. didn't need any additional luck. Although he didn't know it at the time, he had already stepped in it. While the appeal process took place behind the scenes, Damien's case received new life in the Macomb County Circuit Court when, the month after Ron's sentencing, Tim, along with the estate of Damien Sutton, sued Ronald DeMombro Jr., Ronald DeMombro Sr., and Kitty DeMombro for wrongful death, claiming that Ron's parents should be held partially responsible for Damien's death because they allowed their son to care for Damien, despite knowing about, and in fact bearing the brunt, of Ron's history of violence. In addition to wrongful death, Ron Sr. and Kitty were charged in the lawsuit with intentional infliction of emotional distress, premise liability, and negligent supervision. According to the lawsuit, on June 1, 2009, Ron had a violent outburst at his parents' home, becoming enraged and uncontrollable. A similar incident occurred on May 26, 2010, when, court documents stated, Ron ingested and abused prescription medication and became violent and uncontrollable, and subsequently assaulted his father and threatened the man with a gun. The lawsuit, which claimed that Ron Sr. had agreed to babysit Damien on August 21, 2013, but instead allowed his son to watch the toddler, stated, The defendants did not warn Nicole, Timothy, or Damien of Ronnie's violent outbursts or inability to supervise a child, despite their knowledge of his dangerous propensities. Through the lawsuit, Tim Sutton and his son's estate sought a total of $9 million for medical, hospital, and funeral expenses, Damien's pain and suffering, and loss of love, society, and companionship, as well as the future earnings of Damien's heirs. In response to the lawsuit, Randy Rodnick said that his client had no money. I'm not sure where they're expected to collect from him. Eventually, after the DeMombro's homeowner's insurance company became involved in the lawsuit, it was settled in favor of Tim, Damien's estate, and Hastings Mutual Insurance Company for an unspecified amount. Meanwhile, Ron had indeed appealed his conviction, and soon afterward he filed a motion for the appeals court to remand the case back to Macomb County Circuit Court, where he quickly filed a motion for a new trial. Ron's motion was based on two factors. The first was ineffective assistance of counsel, and alleged that Randy Rodnick shaped Ron's defense around a theory of involuntary manslaughter in the hopes that evidence to support such a verdict would surface during the trial. By proceeding under the defense that Damien's death was an accident, Rodnick, Ron alleged, didn't pursue the defense Ron wanted, which was that he hadn't handled Damien in any way that could have caused his death. The second factor was, unfortunately, the kicker. True crime followers may be familiar with the legal term Brady violation. As a huge fan of the Truth and Justice with Bob Ruff podcast, I know this one inside and out. The Brady Rule dictates that the prosecution is required to turn over all materially exculpatory evidence the government possesses in any given case to the defense. This includes all evidence that may be considered favorable to the defendant, such as anything that might lean toward negating or mitigating his guilt. If the prosecution doesn't disclose any such evidence, whether intentionally or otherwise, it's considered evidence suppression, and it can be the basis for a conviction being overturned. Well, in Damien's case, it turned out there were 32 autopsy photographs that the prosecution did not turn over to the defense because they did not have them. The photos were in the possession of medical examiner Dr. Daniel Spitz and later discovered on a disc that Dr. Spitz apparently thought he had turned over to the state, but hadn't. Because these photographs were used in Dr. Spitz's original determination of Damien's cause and manner of death, and because the photos could have been considered favorable or exculpatory, the trial court had to consider them as suppressed evidence, and in January of 2016, Judge Fonts granted Ron's motion for a new trial. The prosecution filed a motion for reconsideration, but due to the obvious, though apparently unintentional, Brady violation, the motion for reconsideration was denied. 
In April of 2016, the prosecution filed an application with the Michigan Court of Appeals for leave to appeal the trial court's order. But the following year, the appeals court affirmed Judge Fonce's order for a new trial, saying the trial court properly concluded that Ron was entitled to a new trial because there is a reasonable probability that, had the evidence been disclosed to the defense, the result of the proceeding would have been different. This did not, of course, mean Ron would have been acquitted. It only means it was a possibility. Unwilling to let the matter drop, the Macomb County Prosecutor's Office further appealed the ruling, which also in 2017 made it before the Michigan Supreme Court. During testimony before the Supreme Court, Dr. Lubisa Dragovich, Oakland County Chief Medical Examiner, was called by Ron's defense team as an expert witness. Dr. Dragovich stated that the 32 previously missing photos indicated that the bruising to Damien's head and brain, originally thought to have been caused by two separate blunt force trauma impacts, was actually caused only by the invasive surgeries performed on Damien's head in the hospital. Dr. Dragovich believed, after reviewing all of the photographs and evidence, that the medical evidence did not support Dr. Spitz's determination from the nature of the injury alone that it was intentionally inflicted. Dr. Dragovich admitted that he could not rule out homicide, but said, Without that indication of intent, we can't distinguish specifically between homicide and accident. He did not take issue with Dr. Spitz's neurological examination of Damien, only his interpretation of the evidence because he felt there was no evidence supporting Dr. Spitz's conclusion that the trauma was intentionally inflicted. Before the end of 2017, the Michigan Supreme Court, in a 4-3 to opinion, denied the prosecutor's office's leave to appeal. Ronald DeMombro Jr. would have his new trial. The second trial of Ronald Anthony DeMombro Jr., who was by this time 31 years old, began on January 16, 2020. For this go-round, Ron had brought in the big guns, retaining high-profile defense attorney Shannon Smith, who previously represented former sports doctor Larry Nassar. Nassar was accused of molesting dozens of female student-athletes while working for Michigan State University, and after pleading guilty to 10 counts of first-degree criminal sexual conduct, Nassar was sentenced to 40 years in state prison. He also received a sentence of 60 years in prison on federal pornography charges, and he is currently incarcerated in a federal penitentiary in Florida. During the second trial, some members of Damien's family were unable to attend. Tim Sutton couldn't bring himself to go through a second trial. Damien's maternal grandma, Nana Tara Thompson, attended the first day before being taken for emergency back surgery the following day. During her opening statement on January 16th, Macomb County Assistant Prosecutor Jean Cloud told the jury that what happened to Damien Ryland Sutton on August 21st, 2013, was no accident. Ron, she said, was the only person who spent time alone with Damien that day, and he later told investigators about ten different stories about how Damien was injured. The evidence would show, Cloud said, that the defendant murdered Damien. Defense attorney Shannon Smith explained in her opening statement that her client didn't offer multiple stories, he simply provided additional information to ensure investigators knew everything that had happened to Damien in the days leading up to his death. She claimed that from the beginning, authorities had tunnel vision, pointing at Ron as the only suspect. Smith said Damien's backward fall off the stool onto the ceramic floor contributed to his death. Proving herself to be a potential poster child for the sleazy defense attorney, Smith even busted out the victim blaming on day one, saying Nikki may be in denial about her contribution to Damien's death. She minimizes it. As a mother, I can understand why she is doing that, because that stool fall contributed to his death. It contributed to the head injuries he sustained. And as a mother, I'm not sure how you could live with yourself, knowing you left your child in the kitchen and that happened. And I'm not saying by any means she is a bad mother. My point is, for her, it's probably the best method. She has to minimize it because it's so tragically sad. If I were to crown a scumbag of the week on this show, Shannon Smith and her client would currently be neck and neck in that race. One more interesting tidbit before I discuss testimony from the second trial. The defense team reportedly spent about $40,000 on its expert witnesses. Think of that what you will. Once again, the first witness on the stand was Damien's mother, who by that time had remarried and was now going by her married name, Nikki Randall. Like at the first trial in 2016, Nikki was once again pregnant. Vacillating between tearful and feisty, Nikki told jurors about the car ride to the hospital with Ron and his father, during which she pointed the finger squarely at her pretend boyfriend. I was just saying, you did this. At the hospital, Nikki recalled, I remember him apologizing, and I remember it disgusted me, and I remember I wanted to hurt him. 
Now, there are moments during my research for every episode when my vision turns red, and right about here was one of them. On Cross, Shannon Smith further cemented her status in the stereotypical slimy defense attorney Hall of Fame by asking Nikki if she could live with herself after not getting medical care for Damien after he fell off the bar stool. Nikki snapped back, I can live with myself. It's hard to live without my son. On redirect by assistant prosecutor Jean Cloud, Nikki said regarding seeking medical treatment after the fall, It wasn't necessary. It didn't cross my mind. What crosses my mind is what I know, instinctual. As a mother, you have instincts. Had Damien required medical treatment, she said, he would have been in the hospital the day of. Nikki described the fall itself as no big deal, saying she and Ron were in the living room while Damien ate at the kitchen island, watching an episode of SpongeBob SquarePants. When she heard the thud, Nikki said, she rushed over to Damien, who cried for 12 or 13 seconds and then appeared normal. Several clips were played for the jurors of recorded jailhouse conversations between Ron and his parents, Kit and Ron Sr. At various points during the conversations, Ron made multiple damning admissions. The day after Damien's hospitalization, he said to his mother, It is my fault. I took responsibility for it. I told the detective I take responsibility for it. It's nobody's fault but mine, to be honest with you. Later the same day, Ron told Kit he was swindled by Detective Erler. Nothing's going to make it right. Nothing ever will. I'm sorry I'm putting you through this. A few days later, Ron admitted to his father that he shook Damien in his playpen in his bedroom. I thought that would help him settle down, crying, throwing a fit. During a phone call with Ron Sr. in November of 2013, Ron admitted to shaking Damien in the past and said he told the detective, I usually would shake him and he would smile. That's what I told him anyway. He would laugh. He would think it was fun. He said that on August 21st, Damien was perfectly fine after the shaking, but a short time later, he found Damien unresponsive. During a December phone call with Ron Sr., Ron said, They got all the evidence they need. I don't know why you guys have any hope. I confessed. They have a slam-dunk case. One expert called to testify was a radiologist, Dr. Gregory Shukimis, who testified that Damien's fatal head injury could have been caused by the fall from the bar stool, and that Damien may have failed to show signs of the injury for a day or longer. Dr. Daniel Spitz, the medical examiner who performed Damien's autopsy, testified later, vehemently and animatedly countering the radiologist's testimony. Under cross-examination by Shannon Smith, Dr. Spitz exclaimed, How do you take a CT scan and say he fell off a stool? I was simply shocked at some of the things he opined. It was based on assumptions. You have to put it in the context of the investigation. Dr. Spitz testified it would be extremely rare for a child to suffer such extensive injuries and not exhibit signs almost immediately afterward. He said the radiologist's theory that Damien would have been lucid for a day or two afterward was nearly impossible. It doesn't fit for one day. It doesn't fit for two days. It doesn't fit for three days. I would be interested if it was minutes or hours. Regarding Damien's fall from the bar stool, when asked if a child could suffer Damien's injuries from such a fall, Dr. Spitz said, I would say it would be rare. I don't want to say it's an absolute impossibility. It's in the realm of possibility, but not very likely. I'm going to stop here for now. Next week, I'll go over the rest of Damien's tragic story, including the outcome of the second trial, and you'll also hear my interview with his maternal grandma, Tara Thompson, who Damien called Nana. That's it for this week. Join me next week for the conclusion of Damien's story. If you like the show, please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. And please subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at www.sufferthelittlechildrenpod.com where you can listen to episodes and become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter at STLC Pod. View photos related to today's case on Facebook and Instagram. Read more about today's case and many others at SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast was written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dream Note Music. Other music and sound effects for the show were created using sounds from AudioJungle.net. Hug your babies a bit closer tonight. Until next week, bye guys.